This morning, we had the great pleasure of listening to a Democratic president who inherited a deficit and turned it into a budget surplus. Now we hear from a Republican governor who faced somewhat similar circumstances. Governor Mitch Daniels inherited an $800 million deficit in his first budget and turned it into a surplus of more than $1 billion. Among other initiatives, he created an economic development corporation to improve Indiana's business climate and create new jobs, and the Healthy Insurance Indiana plan that lowered the numbers of an insured. He also capped property taxes. So two different leaders from different parties did just that. They exhibited leadership, though they did it in different ways, to be sure, reflecting their own philosophies. They restored fiscal soundness. So first, Governor Daniels, a very warm welcome to you, sir. And to interview the governor, we are very fortunate to have the one and only, the wise and inestimable George Will. Gentlemen, welcome. Governor Daniels, as unfortunately he seems determined to go on being known, uh, is a, a good example of what I take to be the Midwestern political culture. Out in the Midwest, where men are men and I am from, they uh, are caught into a kind of low-key but effective leadership, of which I think it's fair to say he uh, is an exemplar. Recently, Governor, you said to an audience here in town that the United States is menaced by a survival-level threat, lethal to liberty, more implacable than those America has defeated before. You were referring to the red menace of red ink. In Indiana, you took a deficit of $900 million, $700 million in 2003, and it became a $1.3 billion surplus in 2009. Could you do the same thing in Washington? I, well, first of all, uh, we have to start with uh, uh, the only operating principle that makes any sense in life, and that's optimism. So we have to say someone could. And if you're asking, uh, would some of those things that we, uh, tools we have uh, employed or steps we took uh, apply, then I think some would, maybe some wouldn't. But uh, uh, it isn't, uh, there isn't anything magic about it uh, if one, uh, summons the, the will and makes the case. Uh, we found in our, in our state that uh, people might not like the individual steps, but they did like the general idea of solvency and they liked uh, the outcome when they saw it. It's often said the American people are ideologically conservative but operationally liberal, that they subscribe to all the principles of limited government until it comes time to limiting government. Did you find that kind of cognitive dissonance in Indiana. We found some of that. I, I remember mumbling under my breath more than once that people say they want straight talk till you hear some, tough decisions till you make some, spending cut till you cut some. Um, but I, uh, I think it's very important not to sell the American people short. Uh, to me, it's the single most uh, um, important thing we can bear in mind. This is a room full of people who understand the problem, the dimension of it uh, we're facing as a nation, as well as any uh, one could assemble in the country. Um, but again, I, uh, uh, I would suggest to you, and I think in miniature at least, we have an example in my state that uh, sure, people will grumble, um, the demagogues will do what demagogues do, but uh, if you act decisively, if you make it clear at every step, every step, that it is average people and people um, of, uh, who are on the lower rung, the lowest rungs of society's ladder that is your first concern, that that's why we do what we do. Uh, and then if you deliver results that uh, you'll not only, you can not only survive, but thrive. At the state level, including in Indiana, you had the advantage, as it were, of not being able to do three things that can be done at the federal level. Mm -hmm. That is, you can't print money. Yep. 
you can't borrow promiscuously, and you do have, however porous it might be, a constitutional requirement that you more or less balance the budget. Washington have, being able to borrow promiscuously to print money and having no constitutional limit, how much does that complicate the task of doing at a federal level what you did at the state level? Enormously. Um, although it's only uh, fair to note that a lot of our sister states have been very expert at escaping or eluding or um, uh, wriggling their way around these, these uh, otherwise uh, wholesome and effective limits. Uh, and that was true in our, ca in our case, too. We have what I construe, anyway, as a balanced budget requirement in Indiana, but it didn't keep our predecessors from spending more than they took in seven consecutive years, running through all the state's uh, reserves, and then uh, using a variety of gimmicks. Uh, you, you, you don't make uh, deposits into the pension funds on time. You, you stiff uh, various uh, uh, people you owe, like schools and universities and localities. Uh, make them do the borrowing, in essence, while they wait for the, uh, the check you're, that you uh, should otherwise send them. So these things are these structural uh, limits on, on government, promiscuity, to use your word, are, I think, very important, but not always decisive. Well, based on your experience as a governor and watching your fellow governors deal, as 49 of them, I guess, do with some kind of constitutional limit, and having seen this from the federal level at OMB, is it your impression that were the nation to adopt a constitutional balanced budget requirement that it would be, not to put too fine a point on it, another occasion of constant lawlessness? Uh, I, do, I, have, I have always favored some uh, uh, sort of constitutional restraint. I don't. Um, uh, I would prefer maybe a supermajority to go beyond um, reason, uh, some, some uh, reasonable limits. But um, one, it isn't a complete answer. It is easily evaded. It will have to, ha if you had one tomorrow morning, it would still have to have exceptions that could always be expanded. And I guess in the current, uh, our current straits, I worry a little bit that it could become a diversion. Uh, a, a, something easier for people to wrestle with than the real challenges that we all know have to be grappled with, the uh, safety net programs and so forth. Um, you know, my own preference, I think, at this moment would be to see if we can't summon our fellow citizens to do what's necessary uh, to uh, square ends and means over the long term, and then on the back side of that, have a good, healthy debate about whether uh, we ought not make it harder legislatively to lapse back into excess. Well, we tried one of those mechanisms, I guess, when you were here in one of your mm -hmm. earlier tours in federal government, named after three no longer senators, Graham, Redmond, and Hollings. Yeah. George, and George Bush's Yale roommates is what somebody called that, wasn't it? That's right. Graham, Redmond, and Hollings. And it put in place a trigger that would be pulled ostensibly to require sequestration or across the budget, yeah. board budget cuts. The trigger would either be disabled or ignored, and it slowly faded away. Mm -hmm. What does that tell us about the possibility of institutional as opposed to what you're talking about, political restraints on spending? Yeah, that, that uh, it, it, they're of limited utility. I mean, my recollection, I stand to be correct, my recollection is it was a blunt instrument, uh, but uh, had some value for a while. But then the, the system finds ways uh, around, uh, uh, around these limits and eventually did. Speaking here to a conservative audience in February, you said our morbidly obese federal government needs not just behavior modification, but bariatric surgery. That sounds like institutional change. Bariatric surgery reduces the amount of calories that get into the system. What's the equivalent here? Well, the, uh, just to be, uh, uh, just maybe to clarify the metaphor, I, 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 maybe I should have said liposuction. Uh, it just seemed a less elegant piece of rhetoric at the time, but I, I, I take your point. Um, I really, I certainly meant major reductions in current spending, not to exclude the idea of something structural. Um, again, maybe a supermajority to, uh, to, to overspend or, um, or, or to go into imbalance. But the, um, no, I mean, um, the arithmetic is, is 
plain as arithmetic ordinarily is, and we will uh, have to, in my opinion, um, it, it, uh, not only transform the safety net or and entitlement programs, I don't like the word, so I keep avoiding it, um, and, uh, but, but also uh, uh, restore the federal government to something, um, afford some kind of affordable shape, and there's no shortage of places to, uh, to uh, go after that. Hey, Christopher Riley in St. Louis, Missouri, who's watching these proceedings from afar, asked the question, should entitlements be limited to a sustainable percentage of GDP? How would that work in an aging society, given that the welfare state is a transfer payments mechanism, transferring wealth to the elderly, yeah. and the elderly are a growing portion of the population? Yeah. Uh, Christopher's watching this at 2.30 in the he's, a, he's an active citizen, I he guess. He really is. Or, or needs Pecu life. We peculiar, have to, yes. <laughs> I'm going with, the, I'm going with the previous theory. Um, well, um, first of all, uh, uh, I, I just, for one, am in favor, of, I could, be in, could be in favor of almost anything that really changes the long-term tra trajectory we're on. Wouldn't want to exclude anything. I have never been particularly enamored of arithmetic formulas, either in the uh, Constitution or even in statute. Um, and, and you point out a good reason to be careful here, George. I mean, um, we are going to be a much older society than we've ever been. We are committed and should be to protecting people uh, in their elderly years against destitution, either financial or driven by a health event. And therefore, I'm not sure anybody knows what a magic percentage of anything that will be necessary to do that. Uh, arguably, it's going to be higher for a while, and then maybe we'll be once again a somewhat younger society, and doesn't have to be that high. But I, uh, I, having said that, uh, I, why would I could listen to almost any approach that might we might get a majority for? Uh, I wouldn't start by trying to identify a talismanic percentage because uh, I'm not smart enough to know what that is. Well, if Americans and their perversity are going to insist on living longer, as they seem determined to do, yeah. doesn't that mean that the growth of government, of, if it's going to have a safety net, is built into the cake? Some of it is, but there's no, there's no reason that uh, you or I or Pete Peterson should be subsidized by our fellow citizens just for, uh, for openers. Um, and uh, those, uh, uh, we all, I, I would hope, would, would agree that um, since our, our desire to uh, look after um, each other um, is, uh, will run up against finite resources, that um, uh, we ought to concentrate them on those who, without which, uh, for, uh, will, uh, will suffer. You've said that when <clears throat> Indiana business leaders come to you and say, what can we do for the great state of Indiana? You say, go and make money, yeah. economic growth. And to that end, you recommend two things. Tax reform that would give us, in your words, mm -hmm. a tax code that looks as though someone designed it on purpose. Mm -hmm. And second, regulatory reform that would be equivalent to untying Gulliver. Did mm -hmm. you do both in Indiana? I would say we did. We've, well, we've structured absolutely everything we've done in our administration around the goal of raising disposable income of our citizens, believing not only that that's a good idea and, and uh, really the essence of the American promise, but that if we, got, if we ever got that right, the government would have the means to do those things we ought to do collectively, and that the, all our other problems would become more manageable. So we have reduced the cost of, of uh, hiring people and uh, making money in our state every way we knew how, most recently by lowering the corporate income tax, but we've lowered a host of other uh, those costs government imposes directly. We've, we've lowered those costs government imposes indirectly, so-called, you know, frictional costs. Uh, we measure everything in our administration, such as how long it takes you to get a permit for something. Time is money is not a uh, figure of speech, we all know. And um, this is what we work on. I've, I defined it as the objective of our administration. Every single uh, person in leadership in our administration knows that um, we're going to be looking at, uh, at their performance based on how well they did or did not contribute to that goal. Uh, 